Hello everyone and welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Dana. Again, I'm a member of the Education Department here and I'm so excited to have you all join us for our 11 o'clock program today. It's going to be just as exciting as the last and just as exciting as the next and we'd love to have you join us all day. Now, this program is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be talking about a habitat that you actually are really able to explore. Um, it's right along our coastline. So we're going to be going over some animals that call it home. We're going to be going over what exactly it is. And we're going to be going over safe ways to explore this habitat and um, kind of talking about some things that you might be able to discover out there. Now, if you want to join us throughout this program, we do encourage you to reach out and text us at this number right here, 562 286-1838. Again, I'm joined in the studio today by James, who is going to be controlling what's going on up here, and by Dave, who's going to be taking those questions from you, passing them over to me, and I will answer them to the best of my ability, or we can kind of have a conference and figure out if we can have an answer between the three of us. Now, um, we also do have a resource for you to text or to to ask questions if you're watching after the fact. That's going to be an email address that's live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. So whether you're joining us live, go ahead and shoot us a text right here. Or if you're watching after, please feel free to reach out, ask any questions that you might have, and we'll get back to you when we can. Now, with that in mind, again, I want to um, remind you that texting rates do apply. Make sure you have adult permission to join in. Otherwise, let's get started. Let's go explore. So to start, we're going to put this on the screen behind me, and I want you to just watch for a minute. I want you to make observations. We're going to practice some scientist skills here, like what do we see? What do we notice? Anything that surprises us? And I want you to take a moment and just look at, the, uh, look at this and think about those questions, all right? And we can start with really simple observations. What colors do you all see in here? Do you see any shapes that you recognize? Are you looking at one animal? Are you looking at any animals? Are you looking at plants? What's going on here? I see movement. Okay, I see movement. I see some greenery up top. I'm going to share my observations with you. I see some stuff that almost looks like it's floating. Like little things. And oh, there's a fish. Sometimes the longer you watch, the more can show up and kind of surprise you. So that was a practice and observation skills, right? What did we notice? What did we, uh, what did we wonder about? Is there anything that we want to discover a little bit more about? And that's something that you can do whether you're out at a habitat like this, whether you're sitting in your bedroom and looking around, or whether you're sitting in a, in a backyard, uh, going for a walk, anything you can do to get your brain thinking about what's going on around you, okay? Now, some of the things that I noticed, right, I noticed movement right in here. This is an anemone. It's an animal that lives um, in a very dynamic habitat, okay? This is a sea star. Again, we've got our fish coming in. And we've got another sea star. This looks like there's a lot of sea stars. What's this, I wonder? Ah, that must just be piping from our aquarium, right? So this is footage of an exhibit that we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. This is from our Northern Touch Pool or Touch Lab. And the reason we call it a Touch Pool or a Touch Lab is because it's actually modeled after a real habitat that we call a tide pool. Now we're going to put um, kind of a video on the screen to show you what a tide pool habitat might look like in the, in the, out in the ocean, or I should say along the side of the ocean. Let's see if we can get that up here. So let's look at the animals while we wait. Wow, there's a lot of colors, right? I love this fish. All right, so when this gets on the screen, I want you to practice those same skills. What do we see? What do we notice? What do we want to know more about? Well, it's really rocky. There's a lot of white water, right? All down here, this is all white water, kind of foamy. Usually means a lot of wave action, right? So those are all things that I noticed on that video right there. And what can I infer? What can I assume by looking at those things? Well, like I mentioned, the white water that we see here and mostly behind me, of course, all up in here, that means wave action. It means that there's movement of water and it's crashing against the rocks. Now, 
That can mean that it's oxygenating the water, which is really beneficial, right? We've talked a lot about how fish and animals in the ocean that have gills need oxygen. They pull that oxygen from the water. And that gets added to the water uh, by mixing like this, okay? Now, what else have we noticed? What else can we see in here? Well, like I said, there's a lot of rocks, lots of rockiness going on. So it's the rocks, actually, that we want to talk about uh, during this program, okay? So these rocks and the movement of the water here, they form what we call a tide pool, a tide pool habitat. Have you ever been to a tide pool? It's actually one of my favorite things to do, especially when we get something called a king tide, which we'll talk about here in a moment. We're going to be pulling up some more footage about tide pools, and we're going to do that same thing. We're going to practice our observation skills. What do we see? What are we curious about? What do we want to discover more about? Is there anything that we're wondering in particular? And then we're going to learn a little bit about how we can explore this habitat. So we're going to be pulling that photo up here in just a moment. But what I want you to look for are colors and shapes and movement like we saw earlier. Okay, the same thing. All right, ah, here we go. Okay, so what do you see? What's going on in here? Well, like I mentioned before, I see rocks. Okay, I see the rocks that are down on the bottom over here. I also see the rocks that are up here, but not right here. What's going on in the middle part? Well, that's sand, right? kind of rocky sand, but it's going to be sandy. But again, I notice a lot of animals, okay? We've got anemones, we've got sea stars all over the place. Oh, that's cool. We want to talk a little bit more about that. We've also got one right here. So there's lots of, and, ooh, and if I look even harder, there's some, the, some shells over here. There's some, oh, there's some other shells right here. Oh my gosh, the longer I look at this picture or this video, the more and more that I see. And tide pools in the natural habitat are the exact same way. So a tide pool is that beautiful spot, magical spot, right where the ocean and the shoreline meet. And I mentioned the rocks, right? So those create natural pools. Now tide is a phenomenon where uh, the movement of the water around the globe kind of travels um, and it's pulled by the gravitational pull of the moon, okay? And so when you have heard the words a high tide or a low tide, it means that the water level is a little bit higher or a little bit lower um, than what we call the average. And that whole stretch between a high tide top line, right, a little bit more water, and a low tide, that's called the intertidal zone. Now, I do think we have a really great time lapse of uh, a tide coming in. It's going to be, I'm going to help James out here and, and direct him where to look. It's in the, uh, either the AV or the B-roll folder. And so it's a beautiful uh, time lapse. And we'll get to watch that water level change and watch how pools appear and how pools disappear. And then we're going to talk a little bit more and we're going to explore what it's like in a pool. So this footage right here is kind of an example of what you would find in a tide pool. It's an example of the rocky habitat, a little bit of the sand down on the bottom like we saw and the animals that call it home. And while we watch this time-lapse video, I want you to think about the challenges that animals who live in a tide pool um, struggle with, okay? What challenges might they face? All right, so go ahead and take a look at this for a quick moment. All right, my friends, I think we were able to find this time lapse. And if not, that's okay. We can always move on. But again, what I want you to look for is the rise and fall of the water. Okay. And think about those challenges. Here we go. So as you can see, it's real. There's a lot of rocks going on, a lot of sand up here. It looks kind of wet. All right. So I wonder why. Did it rain? Oh, look at this. It actually starts to fill up with water. Okay, so this is becoming a high tide. Look, you saw there were some people down there exploring already. 
So this behind me is a low tide, and then as the water made its way in, it becomes a high tide. Now again, that was a time lapse, okay? Um, it's usually a six hour or more kind of transition here. But look at how all of those rocks get covered up. And then as it goes back out, there's a lot of rocky, sandy areas that are exposed. And it's that natural pool that is a tide pool, okay? So while you were watching that, did you think about any of the challenges that those animals might face? Well, if I was living in a little pool like that, what might I think about? Hmm. There's a lot of predators, right? Not only are those animals dealing with predators that come in from the ocean. Ah, here we go. This is beautiful. So this is an example of uh, natural tide pools right here. So not only are they dealing with predators that are coming in from the ocean when it's a high tide, but when it's low tide like this, that's like a seagull buffet. Am I right? It's just free for all, for all the food that they can catch. So how do the animals protect themselves? Hmm. Well, I'm going to list a couple animals that live in tide pools, and I want you to think about what adaptations they might have that help them survive, help them protect themselves. Now, an adaptation is something that the animal has that helps them survive, but we're specifically thinking protection from predators, okay? Um, crabs, okay? Anemones, limpets, it's a weird one, right? And snails, sea urchins, what else? Hmm, even some fish. Now, how might those animals that are living in these shallow pools protect themselves from predators? Well, crabs and uh, crabs have an exoskeleton, right? So it's that hard part that's on the outside of their body. We usually call it a shell, but it's actually their exoskeleton. Okay, so they are hard. Uh, a bird or a predator that's going to go after them is going to be able to uh, going to have to be able to get through a hard shell. Well, what about snails? What do they do? They do the same thing, right? They have that really hard shell protecting their soft body. Now, snails are a part of a group of animals called mollusks. They're really squishy animals that usually have shells to protect them. Okay, what else? I said the anemone. Hmm. What can anemones do to protect themselves? Let's look at this one. Ah, if you were thinking sting, you're right. Some anemones are strong enough to sting, okay? Now, they are related to jellies. And so all jellies and anemones have that stinging cell characteristic. So we want to make sure we're being very gentle if we ever touch one of these. Another thing that anemones can do, especially when it's a low tide, is they can actually close up. And they're able to kind of close in on themselves. And that way, all of this soft stuff right over here is not exposed to the predators that might be out. But if the tide were to come in, you're right, they would be underwater and they would be protecting themselves with those stinging tentacles. What else? I mentioned sea urchins. I love this one. Let's go ahead and see if we can get a photo of a sea urchin up. How do you think this animal might protect itself? I think that one's pretty easy, right? Take a look at the spikes. This is called a spiny skinned animal. It's a group of animals called echinoderms. And their spikiness is a really good protection from animals, right? From different predators. So that was just an example of one challenge, right? They have to deal with predators. Another really easy way to deal with predators is to hide under a rock, right? A lot of animals, as the tide goes out, they'll kind of scurry in under the rocks and find little crevices to hide in. And that way they're less exposed to the birds or the, um, let's see, a lot of other critters that crawl around. Um, I've seen like little river otters or um, martin, right? Or... Um, all sorts of little critters that kind of scavenge along the coastline. We are getting some questions coming in, which I love that. One of them was, why do sharks have different tails? Well, that's a great question. Now, very rarely will you find a shark in a tide pool habitat. Um, I think I have seen a baby in there one time, but it was a really, really big pool. Now, why do they have different tails? Hmm. It kind of depends on what habitat they lived in or they live in. If you tuned into our last program, it was called Sharks. We actually talked about the tail of a zebra shark. It's very long and skinny. Um, and elongate is the word we use. Now, that tail is super long. There we go. Look at that. To help that animal make quick maneuvers and flexible maneuvers through their habitat. They like to live on 
um, the sea floor, and they also like to live in coral reef habitats. So there's a lot of quick little movements that they've got to make. Um, other sharks live in the open ocean. They have to be very strong, very fast swimmers to cover a lot of distance or to chase after large prey. And their tail is usually a little bit shorter, but it's also kind of forked. So one goes that way and one goes that way. It might look like that. And it's very strong and it helps them move really quickly. So their tail really just depends what they're hunting for or what kind of habitat they live in. Now Gage wants to know, Gage, welcome back. We're happy to have you joining us. Uh, can you find a flounder in a tide pool? Good question. So probably not a flounder, but there are other types of flatfish that I have seen in large pools. This is a type of flatfish. Okay, you can see those are actually its little eyes right there. <laughs> and then the fish's body is kind of hanging out right here. All right. So it's a little, oh, here's another really great one. So again, the eyes are going to be up in the front here. Kind of hard to see on that one. And then we've got a pectoral fin. Again, that's the one that's usually on the side and that's its little tail, but you'll notice it's very flat. So while flounder aren't usually found in tide pool habitats, um, I have seen some little flatfish that might be hanging out there, um, but there are some fish that call tide pool habitats home. One of my favorites is actually called a clingfish. Now a clingfish gets its name because those pectoral fins that we've talked so much about are modified into a little suction cup on the bottom of a clingfish's body, okay? Now, why might an animal in a tide pool need a suction cup or something to hold on and latch onto? Hmm. Well, that's another one of the challenges that tide pool animals face. If you recall the very beginning of the program, we watched that footage of the tide pool that was really wavy. There's a lot of rocks, there's a lot of wave movement, and that can be a lot of energy hitting the coastline. And so those animals that call tide pools homes, they need to find a way to hold on nice and tight whenever the tide is coming in, whenever the tide is going out, or whenever there's a lot of wave action. And so that clingfish will hold on nice and tight and they latch onto rocks. They're another one that likes to hide the, on the bottom of rocks, okay? Um, do any other animals in tide pools have a strong, um, strong muscular foot? or a suction cup or anything else to hold them in place. Let's take a look at this footage right here. Is there anything that we notice? Ah, if you guys notice the anemone, they have really strong, we call it their foot, but it's a really strong muscular part that will kind of hold on to the rocks. Once anemones decide where they're gonna settle, it's really hard to move them. What about these animals here? That one, and that one, and that one, and that one. In fact, if you look right here, it's kind of hard to see. You might have to really look. But on this animal, that's a sea star. And the sea stars have something called tube feet. Okay, not two, tube, T-U-B-E. All right, and tube feet are like a lot of little suction cups that are on the bottom of a sea star. And they use them to walk around, okay? But they also use them to hold on to the rock and they can really hold on strong. So when that wave action comes back and forth, sea stars are going to be holding on nice and tight. Okay. What about the crabs? Do they have something to hold on tight with? They don't have any suction cups or any strong muscular feet. But like I said, crabs are one of those that like to hide under rocks. And they also, this is a really big crab, right? They have those legs that they're able to latch onto things. So some crabs will actually hold on to algae that are inside of touch pools, or I'm sorry, inside of tide pools, right? They'll hold on nice and tight. So again, that's one way that they can fight that wave action or all of that energy that's in tide pools. Now I mentioned before that a tide pool habitat is somewhere that you can go explore, right? In fact, I see a lot of people exploring tide pools whenever I'm along the ocean. But one thing you got to be really careful of is to never turn your back to the ocean, right? You always want to pay attention on when the tide is coming in and make sure that there's no waves coming in to sneak up on you, all right? I will say I myself have been caught by the rogue wave or two, okay? And what started out as a wonderful afternoon exploring the tide pools turned out to be a very wet, cold afternoon. Now, Melody wants to know, are there venomous animals in the tide pools to be careful of? Melody, that's such a great question, especially if you are interested in going to explore this habitat. So 
are there venomous animals? Well, there certainly are, right? If you don't know what an animal is, should you be touching it? No, absolutely not. You always want to make sure that if you're exploring a habitat, such as a tide pool, that you're not touching and poking all the animals. You want to look at them, you want to discover as much as you can using your eyes, but you want to make sure that you're respecting those animals. You're not touching them, you're not grabbing them, and you also want to wear closed-toed shoes, okay? It's so easy for us to be like, ah, oh, we're going to the beach, let me throw flip-flops on. But I'm telling you right now, that's the fastest way to get hurt while tide pooling. You want to make sure you're wearing closed-toed shoes, and you're being as safe as you can. There's a lot of water, there's a lot of algae growing. It can be a very slippery environment. So sometimes I'll even wear gloves. That can protect me against the rocks and any animals, right? And then Liana wanted to know, where do we get our animals from? Really good question. Now, we have animals that range from our invertebrates, such as these, animals without a backbone, up to large vertebrates like our sharks. Some of our animals uh, came from collections. Other animals, uh, like we would have a special permit that allows us to go out and collect them. Other animals are through the trade of the aquarium institutions. A lot of aquariums and zoos will work together and, um, and we can transport animals and share them that way. So we get our animals from a number of different locations, uh, but there's just some examples. Now, we talked about two challenges. We talked about um, the wave action and we talked about the predators. Are there any other challenges you can think of if you were a tide pool animal? Hmm. Oh, I've got one. Look how dry some of these areas are. See how there's a lot of water over here, which is good. But it looks like it got dry right in here. Right? How do you stay in a safe area where you're not going to dry out? Wow. That's a big one. So a big fancy word that we call, say is desiccation. But what it means is drying out. How do tide pool animals who usually live underwater, but can live out of the water, but mostly underwater, but are they out, right? It's very confusing. How do they stay wet? Well, there's a couple of adaptations that animals have found. One of them is that uh, exoskeleton that we talked about in crabs, right? They can kind of make sure that their body and their, their uh, inside their exoskeleton has a lot of water in it, um, able to stay wet in there. How else? Well, what about our anemones? I actually really love this one. I mentioned how anemones can <laughs> curl up on themselves and close, right? Now, a lot of anemones in our tide pools here in Southern California, you'll usually find aggregating anemones. And when they close up, the outside of their body is covered in little shells and rocks and sand. And that's one way that they cover their body with all those little pieces to keep from the water from evaporating, okay? So as the tide goes out, not only does the water level lower, but we also have to deal with evaporation, right? The sun shining from above, kind of drawing that water out. And so using that little rocky layer, I almost like to think of it as sunscreen for the anemone, right? They're trying to make sure that they're nice and protected from losing any water. And then of course the closing up is another adaptation that allows them to stay nice and wet. What else? Hmm. Well, what about the clingfish? How do fish stay like underwater in tide pools? Again, I mentioned the fact that a lot of our uh, clingfish like to hang out on the bottom side of rocks. We also find sea slugs there and they like to stay nice and moist as well. So under the rocks, you're a lot less likely to dry out because you have the rock over you so the water's not evaporating and it's usually a little bit cooler, okay? So all really good adaptations to stay nice and, and um, as underwater as they can in a drying out tide pool. So we've got predators, we've got drying out, we've got wave action. Are there any other threats or challenges that a tide pool animal might have to face? One more time, I'm going to let you just take a look at this screen here. What do you notice? Hmm. Ah, I've got one. What if I'm an animal that can't get out of the water? Okay. What if I'm a little fish and I'm hanging out in this pool right here and I'm really hungry? Uh-oh. What if there's no food in this pool? What do I do? Well, some animals, they can wait quite a while between feedings. Okay. 
right? So the water will eventually come from the side, come back in, and then they can move to different pools. They can explore and look for food. So a lot of animals will actually hunt during high tide. That way they can move around and find uh, prey. Other animals like to feed on the algae that grows in tide pools. For example, that uh, purple sea urchin that we saw, they feed on giant kelp, but they can feed on a lot of other algaes as well. In fact, this is that purple urchin, and this thing that it's hanging out on, this is a blade of giant kelp. Cool, huh? Some animals like to, there's a lot of little snails in tide pools, so some animals will feed on the snails that get stuck in tide pools. So there's a lot of different ways that they can um, catch food. Oftentimes they are waiting for that high tide to come back, right? So you can always be assured that the water will return and you can move to another pool if you have to. All right, so we've got drying out, we've got predators, we've got hmm, um, wave action, we've got finding food. Are there any other things you can think of that might scare or challenge a tide pool animal? Hmm. Let's see if we can get that time lapse again or just another footage um, along the California coast of some tide pools. Okay. And again, I want you to make some observations. What do you see? What do you notice? And what challenges might those animals face? All right. Okay. So let's think. Here's some examples. Hmm. Sea stars, the fish, anemones. I'm going to have to think about this one for a minute. I'd love if you would join me. Hmm. Huh, let's look at this. Wait till the end. See if you notice anything. Whoa. Oh, I saw it twice. Did you see people exploring the tide pool habitat? Yeah, so my friends, I mentioned a lot of natural threats and natural... Um, challenges that they might have to overcome, but I talked about how we can go out and explore this habitat. You don't have to have special snorkel gear. You don't have to have scuba gear. You don't have to have a boat. You can just walk along the seashore and explore um, all sorts of animals and all sorts of um, organisms like algaes as well that live here, right? But again, we want to make sure we're being careful while doing it. So I mentioned closed-toed shoes when Melody asked about um, anything that we should pay extra special care to. So not only do you want closed-toed shoes, but you also want to make sure that you're not stepping on a bunch of things, right? I encourage you to explore, but explore safely, both for you and the animals, okay? So am I just going to trap straight through and step on all of stuff? Absolutely not. I'm going to step carefully. I'm going to look, okay? Ooh, Melody's thinking of some other challenges. We'll jump to that one in a moment. That's a really good thought. And so... We want to make sure we're being very careful because if you recall in the beginning, the longer we watched, the more we saw, right? That fish kind of came in in a video towards the end and that was actually a recorded little section. But what happens if we were to just sit and watch in nature and see what shows up? So move slow, be careful, and remember there's a lot of animals that call that habitat home. You don't want to become so challenging that the animal gets too stressed out. Now, Melody thought of another challenge, and that was oxygen. Melody, great thought, right? I mentioned that uh, a lot of these animals have gills. Well, how do they breathe when the water is out? Well, it kind of goes back to that desiccation aspect or the drying out, right? They want to make sure that they're at least in a place that allows them to stay safe. One of our animals, it's called the, um, it's, uh, I mentioned the intertidal zone, and it's way up at the top of it. So it only gets wet every now and then when we get a really, really high tide. And a lot of them are uh, uh, snails, okay, or hermit crabs often are up there. And they're able, snails have this really cool adaptation. It's called an operculum. Okay, I'm going to grab a snail shell here. Let's see, right here. This, uh, let's grab another one. Here we go. This is a great snail shell, okay. Now the snail's soft body is going to live inside. Ooh! Sorry. <laughs> Do it great in here. <laughs> There's something squishy. It's a cotton ball. <laughs> um, so the snail's going to live in there. And then 
when it tucks all the way in, it actually has what I like to call a little trap door. My two friends in here are cracking up right now. <laughs> a little trap door that closes up. Now, not only is it protecting that soft body from predators, but what else, what else can it be doing? There's a little bit of a delay on the feed, my friends, and Dave just got to watch that again as I dropped the shell and got scared. Um, so it closes up. It's protected from predators, but it's also protected from drying out, and it's keeping water in there, allowing it to breathe and get that oxygen. So really great question, Melody. That was really, really thoughtful. And it's one of those things that you can explore. Now, I don't have time to answer all the questions that you might have about tide pool habitats, and that's where exploration from you comes in. So if you don't, if you're, I know a lot of us aren't able, uh, our beaches are closed for the most part, right? So we're not able to do that right now, but there's resources online that you can explore tide pools at as well. So I encourage you to check that out, uh, watch videos, read about some of the animals that call that home. And if you ever want to know more, remember we do have our live at lbaop.com com dot org sorry um, email address that you can reach out to now we're out of time here in the studio for this program we're going to go on a lunch break here but we'd love to see you back at one o'clock we're going to be talking about uh, coral reefs and their conservation so it's going to be a really special topic we'd love to have you join us and we'll see you then bye everyone <laughs>